Ladies and gentlemen, firstly, welcome. Welcome to Flat Earth Social Event number God knows what it is. Um, I think it's 13, could be 14. We missed a week, I can't remember. But listen, a couple of things. There's a lot of people here tonight, and I think there are more coming. Um, just be mindful of that. Please be mindful of this line here where they serve the food and do all their things. A um, couple of things, just like to thank the pub again, the Pavilion Arms for putting on this event and treating us so well, so thank you very much for that. Okay, um, I also have to point to the fact that it is a donation event, and I know lots of you have already contributed, but if you do find it in your wallets, there's a box there, put some money in, thanks a lot. If you don't, I don't care. Now, <clears throat> our next guest, I've known Mark, for some years now. Uh, we met firstly at the Flat Earth Conference, the first UK Flat Earth Conference in Kidderminster back in the day. Um, I also met Mark later, a couple of years later, at a Birmingham Do uh, a Truth Juice event. Uh, and like all our other events and guests, Mark Sargent, David Weiss, Dave Murphy, we add the wonderful Mark Devlin to our list of events. So, uh, Mark, I'm keeping talking. Mark is an accomplished author <laughs> and a speaker and presenter. He's a wonderful guy. He's a world-renowned DJ. Did you know this? Yeah, yeah all right. <laughs> um, so Mark is a man of the people. Sorry, my lovely. He's here today with his time. We're nearly there. Oh. Oh. Oh, something's happening. Oh, here we go. Yeah, don't show the porn, Mark. So it's a joke, it's a joke, it's a joke. Yeah, come on, it was funny, wasn't it? No, it's not funny. It's all panda, darling. What? What does it say on that shirt? Be happy. Yes. I'm being happy. Right, ladies and gentlemen. I'm waiting for Mark's thing. So, shall we sing a song? No. We have some events coming up. We have, next month, we have uh, superstar Flat Earth singer Alex Michael, the Flat Earth man, going to be doing a video from us there. In October... I'm not going to say what October is. Hopefully, if we're not all locked down or dead, um, we are going to have a very, very special private Halloween do with a very, very special guest. But I can't say. Because he might not come. So, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, can we please give... A very warm flat earth social welcome to the legend that is Mark Devlin. Thanks very much, Ian. Evening, everyone. My name is Mark, and I am a spinning ball denier. And I'm in good company here, right? The thing about that is that just before I went to print with my first Musical Truth book, which is going back to early 2016 now, that was January 2016, I'll put that out. That book was written in 2014 and 2015, and it was right around the time that I was researching this whole subject area. And like many of us, I'm sure, the more I looked into it, the more apparent it became, even though at the outset, when the suggestion first hit my radar that we may not live on a spinning ball as we've been conditioned our entire lives to believe I dismissed it as complete nonsense and impossible and preposterous but the more I looked into it the more I just couldn't deny what I was seeing and I realised that as I was about to go to print with that book it was... <laughs> It's just a trick I like to do, aren't we? <laughs> yeah, he's checking if we're on the ball. It works. No pun intended. <laughs> there actually wasn't. Anyway, 
So I realised that this manuscript for my book was absolutely loaded with references to global. Global this, global that. And in all good conscience, I could not put that book out in the state of consciousness that I was currently at, having those words in there. So I recalled the manuscript at great cost to myself before the book got printed and took out every reference to global and replaced it with worldwide. And there's been no looking back since. Had to be done, right? What I'm going to be speaking to you about this evening is my regular subject area, so it's pretty much my comfort zone. I'm not talking about spinning balls and such. Uh, I do get into that occasionally. But I'm going to be talking about the machinations of the corporate music industry and what it's really used for, its true nature, the agendas that it's used to push. So this is something that I've researched now for the best part of 15 years. It's resulted in the three volumes of my Musical Truth book, I've done, I don't even know how many live talks, podcasts, videos, interviews on these subjects over the past 15 years. So I do pretty much know this stuff inside out, but I appreciate that for many of you, it might be your first introduction to all of this. And it can tend to be quite shocking when you realise that the music industry is not about fun, entertainment, letting your hair down, enjoying some music at the weekend, escaping the drudgery of your everyday life by escaping into these worlds, but is in fact all about mass mind control, social engineering, and the push pushing of various societal agendas. All will become clear as we move along anyway. And what I want to get into first of all is, why is that not working? Okay, so we've got got a challenge here. Could you try again? I'll just knock the telly off again, I'll not. Yeah, knock the telly off, see if that works. What's going on there? Oh, that's interesting, isn't it? Very interesting. I might have broken the telly. What would life be without challenges, eh? Turn it on and off. Or give it a good kick. It's not happening, is it? Very strange. Well, how interesting. So, if ever there's a technical problem, never ask me to sort it out, okay? That's why we have engineers. Right, so, I'm going to be presenting excerpts from my research into the world of lifetime actors and culture creation. We have Bono here, illustrating the point. Very popular character, I'm sure you would agree. We can sum up this overall dynamic in the words of Edward Bernays, the master propagandist double nephew of Sigmund Freud coming out of that particular bloodline family and credited with being the father of the concept of public relations. He knew a thing or two about how to manipulate the human psyche, which stood him in good stead for a career lasting several decades. 
So in his classic piece of work, simply titled Propaganda, which came out in 1928, the opening paragraph stated, we are governed, our minds are molded, our tastes formed, our ideas suggested, largely by men we have never heard of. That overarching dynamic is as relevant today as it was when those words were first written almost 100 years ago. I learned a lot about how culture creation and lifetime actors work from these two researchers, Joseph Atwill, author of Caesar's Messiah, and also a guy named Jan Irvin, who a few years ago had a great podcast series titled Unspun. And they went into how social engineering gets done, specifically through popular culture. I learned many things from these shows. You can still get them online. It used to come through Gnostic Media. These days it's known as Logos Media. But it taught me a great many things about how these agendas get pushed. So it's the realm of the lifetime actor, which is a term coined by the aforementioned Joe Atwill, and it addresses individuals who have become household names through their public personas. So Bill Gates is a great example. A lot of people think of him as this nerdy computer guy who invented Microsoft in his garage, you know, like you do. And he's a philanthropist. He's a really nice guy with a big heart. So he gives away billions of dollars every year to good causes because he cares, you know. That's the way people want you thinking of Bill Gates. That's the way the propagandists present him. Of course, when you do the research into his true nature, the family that he came out of, who his father was, it presents a rather different picture of him. You know, psychopathic, eugenicist, abomination of humanity, that sort of thing. So Gates's father, William H. Gates Sr., had been head of the Planned Parenthood organization, which had evolved at the American Eugenics Society. So he's all about population reduction, removing unwanted swathes of society from the human gene pool, and as the man who has led the worldwide vaccination agenda these past few years, what could possibly go wrong? No conflict of interest there, right? So here he is, as mentioned in my book, vicious, psychopathic eugenicist disguised as socially inadequate nerd, Bill Gates, indirectly responsible for the suffering and deaths of untold millions. Not a man you'd want to be on karmic payback day. Good luck there, Bill. So Bill Gates stands as a good example of a lifetime actor. He's thought of as one thing or another, in his case, a business leader, a technological entrepreneur, but the truth is that he's something rather different than that. And lifetime actors come in all shapes and sizes. They don't have to be business leaders. They can be Hollywood actors. They can be television stars. They can be professional sports people. They can be musicians. Anyone that's in the public eye, anyone that has a public persona, anyone who you've heard of, basically, if they've been placed there, if they're in that kind of prominent, influential role in society, their career will have been gifted to them. Because it's impossible to attain those positions yourself, under your own steam, just through hard work and keeping your fingers crossed for good luck. Doesn't work that way. So culture creation comes out of the same category as these lifetime actors. So any fad, trend, movement or scene which sweeps up large numbers of people in its wake, usually in the millions, can be demonstrated to have been the product of social engineering in the same way that these individuals can. So in the same way that we can point to a great many famous musicians and present all the evidence to show that they're simply lifetime actors on the payroll pushing agendas, and there are plenty of examples of them in this talk, so it is with any scene, any genre, and the 60s counterculture hippie flower power scene stands as a masterclass study in how all this stuff gets done. So much information, evidence, proof has come to light in recent years to demonstrate that that entire movement occurred to a very large extent at the hands of social engineers working in conjunction with military intelligence operations. So where you find organizations like the CIA, the FBI, MI5, MI6, then military intelligence grade social engineering think tanks like the Tavistock Institute 
which is why I've got a t-shirt saying Tavistock resistant. It's nothing against the town in Devon. I have no problem with it. I'm talking about the Tavistock Institute, which is where so many of these agendas get cooked up. Where you find one, you find another. Where you find military intelligence, unfortunately, you usually find satanic ritual abuse and trauma-based mind control is never far from the surface. Where you find that, you find dark, occult, ritualistic practices, such as Satanism, never far from the surface. And where you find that, regrettably, unfortunately, pedophilia is usually following in close wake. So all these subjects are interrelated and cross-correlated. So the 60s counterculture hippie scene bears all the hallmarks of having occurred to a very large extent at the hands of the CIA. There's a great book which came out nine years ago, 2014, titled Weird Scenes Inside the Canyon. This book taught me a lot. This instructed me in much of the research and the style of research that I now do. It was put out there by an author and researcher going by the name of David McGowan. Just out of interest, how many people here have heard of Dave McGowan or have read this book? Okay, just a small handful. I usually find this in my talks, actually. Uh, most people seem to be not aware of what Dave McGowan presented. So in a nutshell, his day job was that he was a builder. He had his own construction firm, but he was always a fan of 60s music. This stuff that emerged in the mid to late 60s and changed the perceptions of an entire generation, which is the plan. And he was a fan of so many of the bands which emerged out of the Laurel Canyon district in the Hollywood Hills of Los Angeles. He got given a book which went into the backgrounds of so many of these prominent bands. And he realized there were a few strange factors at play. Almost without exception, the fathers of these prominent musicians had direct connections into the world of the military or military intelligence. So they were very high ranking. They were generals, they were admirals, they had connections to the CIA, they had connections to the Pentagon, the Defense Department, different expressions of government. And he realized that these bands and these solo musicians were being drawn magnet-like to Laurel Canyon from all over the United States, also from Canada, and in some cases the UK. And he wanted to know what it was about this place that was drawing them all in, given that it had no musical heritage whatsoever prior to the mid-1960s. What it did have in the neighborhood was a covert military research base, which was known as Lookout Mountain. A lot of government and military propaganda films, thousands of them in fact, got produced at this facility. And right in the middle of it was this neighborhood where all these musicians were congregating. And McGowan's research showed that there was barely an exception to the rule that the fathers of all these musicians were involved in those kind of professions. The best example which really illustrates the point is that of Jim Morrison, front man of the group, the group, The Doors, which were really front and center of that whole counterculture scene. So here we have a picture from 1964 of a young, young James Douglas Morrison on the bridge of the ship which his father commanded. So his dad on the right there is Admiral George Stephen Morrison. Here's another picture of him. And his claim to fame is that he just happened to be the Navy Admiral in charge of the fleet of ships involved in the Gulf of Tonkin false flag incident, which was used as an excuse to springboard America into the long, bloody, protracted Vietnam War. And yet, his son was put out there as the front man for one of the groups which ostensibly espoused the value system of the young people of the time, the generation known as the baby boomers, those born towards the tail end of the Second World War and in the years that immediately followed, that generation was inherently opposed to war, particularly Vietnam, and they stood for some very anti-establishment values in their outlook. So somehow we have to reconcile Jim Morrison as he became this iconic rock god 
this poster child for that anti-war, anti-establishment generation with the fact that his father basically started the Vietnam War to which so many of him and his musician friends were so strongly opposed. You could chalk it up as an isolated incident. You could say, as many have tried to argue, that Jim was simply rebelling against his father's value system. And in interviews, Jim Morrison did used to say, my parents are dead, as in, they're dead to me. And if this were an isolated incident, then maybe you could accept that that's the case. But it's very far from that. And in McGowan's book, he demonstrates through endless examples how it's virtually impossible to find any of these musicians from that generation whose dads weren't in that kind of role. So one way that we can reconcile it is by accepting that Jim Morrison was an actor, a lifetime actor. On YouTube, you can find another video of him from 1964 where he's doing a commercial for a university in Florida. This is how he looks, very clean cut, very scholarly. He's got his college blazer, he's got his books under his arm, and he's advertising this Florida State University. So this was the acting gig that he got before he got the gig of Jim Morrison, the iconic rock god, which he then went on to fulfill from 1965 onwards. So the doors emerged pretty much overnight with hundreds of songs ready written, with a whole bunch of instrumental riffs, even though they didn't actually perform on many of their studio recordings, and all ready to go with a fully formed image. This is because they were a manufactured group coming from military grade social engineering think tanks. And they were behind all of the groups that shaped and molded all those cultural values in those times. The idea of it all, which they've been doing forever, these social engineers, is to break up the unity and the cohesion that comes from the traditional family unit. They love pitting one generation's value systems against that of another. So at the time, they were taking these young people and they were stirring up all this anti-war, anti-establishment sentiment within them, and it was setting them at odds with what their parents' generation represented. They were changing attitudes towards rock music, coming through all these groups emerging from Laurel Canyon and out of Haight-Ashbury in San Francisco, a big part of that flower power scene, changing attitudes towards drugs, changing attitudes towards sex, towards family, towards relationship, and the common denominator between them all was that they were sowing, fomenting discord within society. You may have noticed that's still going on today. The methods and the tactics may change, but the overall agenda remains the same. They use their assets to get the job done. Just before I move on to Dave McGowan, it's worth mentioning that one year after he published that book in 2014, on the 22nd of November 2015, the anniversary of the Kennedy assassination, he passed away of an extremely fast-acting, aggressive form of cancer. And we can draw our own conclusions from that. But he left behind an incredible legacy of work, which has been very influential on a lot of people, not least myself. Also, in that counterculture era of the 1960s, we had the emergence of various consciousness gurus. So, as well as the changing rock music, psychedelic stuff, the folk rock, the country rock, all these different styles that were replacing what had been there previously, we had gurus such as Dr. Timothy Leary. He was a Harvard professor who was kicked out of his academic role through espousing the use of various psychedelics or entheogens as they're sometimes referred to, particularly LSD. He popularized the idea of young people going on these trips, going on these journeys of self-discovery through LSD in conjunction with all the psychedelic rock music of the time. And he was embraced by that counterculture generation as a result. He was seen as something of a cultural hero. Well, by his own admission in many of his later interviews, Timothy Leary was an asset of the CIA. And you can get footage of him on YouTube 
basically talking about how the agency funded his work into psychedelic studies and were responsible for putting so much of the LSD into the hippie community during those times. So all this LSD, all this acid that was turning up at these hippie communes, these gatherings, these big music festivals, like the Monterey Pop Festival, Woodstock, and everything in between, was coming directly through CIA supply lines. Various characters were involved. Much documentation has come to the fore, not least through the work of Joe Atwill and Jan Irving to prove this to be the case. Another countercultural icon of those times was Gloria Steinem, who was held up as a heroine of the modern feminist movement. She was the founder of Ms. Magazine. Right around the time that she launched it and started putting her messages out, we had the arrival of the birth control pill available again in unending quantities. So right at the same time as you had these mind-altering drugs such as LSD, the, the changing face of rock music, changing attitudes towards sex and family and everything else, you have the arrival of the birth control pill in line with the free love, sex, drugs and rock and roll value system of those times, and you have Gloria Steinem pushing the whole idea of feminism. So the cover story is that women should be treated equally as men, so they should be allowed to do the same jobs as men. But the real idea behind that movement was to get as many women as possible into the workplace and out of the home, away from those traditional nurturing roles, away from their children, put the children into state care, so-called, ever earlier in their lives, and get women contributing to the taxation system in the same way as their male counterparts already do. So it's a win-win for the system, not such a win for the traditional family unit. Once again, all part of the same agenda. And Gloria Steinem, by the way, also turns out to have been an asset of the CIA on the agency's payroll, taking a fee for the pushing of these agendas. So a pattern starts to emerge. Pretty much the house band of that whole hippie scene was the Grateful Dead. And there are many fans of this group to, who to this day still proudly proclaim themselves to be deadheads. They'll say, yeah, I'm a deadhead, man. And they think it's a term of endearment. What they don't realize is that the occult practitioners who devise these agendas and who sit atop the music industry are satanically mocking them mocking what they see as their ignorance and their profanity. They love it when these people refer to themselves as deadheads, because that's how they see them. That's how they see all of us. They lump us all in together as useless eaters in how they consider us to be. So when you get into the personnel behind the Grateful Dead and you do some background checks, you find some very interesting things and some more trends and patterns start to emerge. So we have direct links into Freemasonry. We have links into the Bohemian Club, from which we get Bohemian Grove. You may have heard of it. Links into the Century Club, which is like Bohemian Grove's East Coast equivalent. It's a secret uh, society, mystery school, school fraternity. Direct links into Harvard and Yale universities and other expressions of government, the establishment, and aristocratic bloodline families. So the Grateful Dead, not quite who they would appear to be. Another interesting little tidbit that I like to throw in there is that the father of the Grateful Dead's music publisher, Alan Trist, just happens to have been one Eric Trist, who was one of the founders of the Tavistock Institute of Human Relations in London which is the leading organisation behind all these worldwide social engineering psyops. And earlier, Rody for the Grateful Dead, road manager before Alan Trist got involved in all of that, was a guy by the name of Hank Harrison, who, as well as being the biological father of Courtney Love, Kurt Cobain's missus, also spent time working as an asset of the CIA. Does it ever end? Well, that's one psyop. Yeah, don't worry. I know. If I haven't got round to your own particular favourite group or musician or scene, please bear with me. Be patient. I'm doing them one by one, okay? 
We got any acid house ravers in the house? Yeah. All right, so I'm just about to piss off your evening as well. Let's move on. No, Techno's next. We're going to be doing punk. We'll be doing new wave. Don't worry, don't worry. We'll get there. Bowie, yeah? yeah. No, Bowie's not in this talk, actually, to be fair. He's next week. So, Acid House. Now, I was caught up in this one. So, you know, the second summer of love. I've just done a whole podcast series of four episodes examining the second summer of love, so-called. That's what the mainstream media at the time referred to it as. On its 35th anniversary. So in 1988, I was right there, rife for manipulation. I was caught up in this whole thing. I loved the music. I loved the clubs. I loved the culture. And yeah, I was had. I was duped. I was mugged off. We all are in some way. If they don't get you with one artist or one scene, they get you with another. And I now see that whole acid house rave culture, which emerged in the late 1980s in the UK, and paved the way for the explosion in electronic dance music and club culture all around the world as basically a reboot of what they had done in the 1960s in America. So instead of psychedelic rock coming along to replace previous forms of rock music, in this version you had new forms of electronic dance music. Instead of LSD everywhere, you had MDMA ecstasy, and there's much evidence to show that so many of the pills so <laughs> were coming out of British military intelligence. Those nice people at MI5 who just want to keep us all safe were actually putting many of these pills out into the raves and into the clubs. And then the other common factor was that in the 60s where you had these music festivals and these hippie gatherings and such, in the 80s version it was warehouse parties, it was open air raves, it was the super clubs. It was the coming together of large numbers of young people, sharing experience together, going on these journeys of altered consciousness through the drugs, enjoying the music, enjoying the togetherness, enjoying the rhythm, the dance, the ceremonial aspect of it all. All of that was being tapped into by the social engineers who put these scenes together. The song by The Who, a group who would know a thing or two about this, being, as I suspect, products again of military intelligence uh, psyops they had their song won't get fooled again am i killing your life here <laughs> weeping bitterly uh, it's a bastard it really is but uh, i always ask people to remember that i don't make things this way i found them this way i'm just reporting on what i found you know don't get mad at the messenger, get mad at the psychopaths who put these agendas into place. I wish it was some other way. I wish I didn't have to deliver this information, but for as long as I see it this way, I consider it my personal responsibility to share this information. So that's why I do it. I don't get any twisted, perverted joy out of destroying people's lives, you know, despite what some might think. So in the song, Won't Get Fooled Again by The Who, which is speaking directly to these dynamics of social engineering, they had the lyrics, there's nothing in the streets looks any different to me. And the slogans are replaced by the by. And the parting on the left is now the parting on the right. And the beards have all grown longer overnight. So they're talking about how fashions, trends, different aspects of culture are always fomented and cultivated by, as Edward Bernays would have said, men we have largely never heard of. We're going back even further with Albert Pike, the Civil War era military general and 33rd degree master Freemason, who, when would this have been? 1860s, I guess, sometime around then, said, whenever the people need a hero, we shall supply him. So even back then, they were talking about how culture gets manufactured. And these heroes that are served up to us come in all shapes and sizes. And to many people, they are very convincing. They're very plausible. Uh, some are easier to spot than others. Uh, you know, I personally was never taken in by this individual. Never bought his act at all. Never found him funny as a comedian, even before he reinvented himself as some sort of consciousness guru 
for the people, you know. Don't I hear the word wanker over there somewhere? It's quite appropriate. Yeah, as a comedian, I always found him about as funny as a cancer diagnosis, personally. Joe Rogan, yeah, I mean, you know, there's, there's so many that we could, there's so many that we could put out there as examples. Russell Brand's true nature is that of a completely controlled asset of these very agencies that we're talking about. And it's worth remembering that before he reinvented himself with the trues or whatever he calls his little show now, he served a period as Katy Perry's mind control handler. So he was married to her for a short time. Spoiler alert, the marriage didn't last. But this is what happens with so many of these pop stars. This is another part of the uh, tapestry of information that I present. In other presentations that I do, I go way into the murky world of MK Ultra mind control and its different derivatives. One of them which plays out in the entertainment industry is known as monarch programming. And Katy Perry ticks all the boxes for a singer, for an asset of the system who has undergone that style of programming. What happens is that they're allotted handlers. And the handlers make sure that the programming remains intact. They make sure that they stick with the agenda, don't go off script, don't become loose cannons. And handlers, in so many cases, as well as having been programmed themselves, are spouses, romantic partners, or wives or husbands. So when you find somebody like Russell Brand popping up as Katy Perry's husband, it makes a whole lot of sense because his real role is as her handler. And in the short video clip that I've got here, it gives a very revealing insight into the nature of the relationship between a mind control subject, subject and a handler. So this was a, a Grammys award due from a few years ago, a red carpet event which was televised. Pay very close attention to Katie's behavior and then what Russell does when he decides he doesn't like the way she's acting. Okay, let's take a look at this. What did you think of the whole shebang? I thought it was... You didn't watch it! I, my favourite <laughs> bit was when Chalky each fell over on the carpet and then uh, pit squeaks come over and then uh, Sneezy went, No! That was my, probably my favourite bit. You just put him right in it now. I did watch the I Oscars. I call him on bullshit. Don't swear. No, oh, this is morning television. This is morning television. In England. In so listen, who are you happy to see win? I mean... <laughs> I'm happy that for everyone, really. Just everyone. Hey, people that won, people that were nominated, people that were just there. Katie, it's unsung heroes, the people that fill the seats. Of course. Katie, how do you deal with this? Um, uh, uh, <laughs> no, he's actually hilarious. I'm glad you find him fun. Speechless. Usually I'm the, like, bubbly and I'm just like, Oh my god, you're so funny, I can't believe it. And have a lovely night. I know you've been pulled away back, left and center. Uh, all right, so did you clock what happened then? So Kate is starting to go a bit off script. Russell decides, as her handler, that he doesn't like the way she's acting. So he holds up a pendant with the word obey on it. And Katie momentarily catches glimpse of it. And when she does, her whole demeanor changes. And from that point, Russell starts to take control of the situation. At the end there, he's leading her away in quite an aggressive manner, so he's regained control. Do you want to see it again? Yeah. Now you know what you're looking for. So midway through, watch for what Russell is holding up and watch for the change in Katie when he does. What did you think of the whole shebang? I thought it you was... You didn't uh, watch it! I, my favourite <laughs> bit was when Chalky each fell over on the carpet and then uh, pit squeaks come over and then uh, Sneezy went, No! That was my, probably my favourite bit. You just put him right in it now. I did watch the I Oscars. I call him bullshit. Don't swear. Oh, this is morning television. This is morning television. In England. So listen, who are you happy to see win? I mean... I'm happy that for everyone, really. Just everyone. Hey, people that won, people that were nominated, people that were just there. Katie! It's unsung heroes, the people that fill the seats. Of course. Katie, how do you deal with this guy? Um, uh, uh, <laughs> no, he's actually hilarious. I'm glad you find him fun. Speechless. Usually I'm the, like, bubbly and I'm just like, oh my god, you're so fun. All right, so that's where it all changes, where Russell regains control over the situation. 
And uh, a short while after that, those two split up. I know, hard to believe, but there you go. So the reason I've included this is just as a little reminder of how many sirs we find in the entertainment business, particularly in the music industry. And a general rule of thumb with which you'll never go far wrong is never trust a sir. There's a lot from around, Sir Jimmy. Here's a very early picture of another very famous rock star, Sir. What we're looking at here is a picture from 1960 of an 18 year old Mick Jagger. Long before he became Sir Mick, he's given it one of the favoured so called Illuminati hand signs there with the 666. He's been well trained in what to do there. Now, this brings us in to an interesting excerpt that I want to play you from an interview that I did a few months ago with a lady named Anne Diamond. Now she claims to have been inducted into the MKUltra mind control experiments coming out of the Allen Memorial at McGill University in Montreal, Canada. She says that she was inducted into these programs from early childhood. She says that for 20 odd years, she was in a relationship with Leonard Cohen the singer-songwriter, who was a big part of that 60s counterculture scene. And she says that uh, Leonard had a habit of, as well as being a performer, singer, popping up at various locations around the world where a military coup was about to take place. And when he wasn't doing that, he had a habit of popping up at various locations around the world where a famous rock musician was about to get assassinated. He doubled as a spy for CIA and Mossad. In other words, that's what she says about him. So she says that in September 1970, he popped up in London a few days before Jimi Hendrix was offed, was killed, because that's what happened to him, at the hands of his manager, a guy named Michael Jeffrey, who also happens to have been an asset of British military intelligence. So we're told that Jimi Hendrix choked on barbiturates, uh, you know, drowned on his own vomit, effectively. But according to multiple other claims, not least from the physician who performed the post-mortem on him, he was actually waterboarded with red wine. So many bottles of red wine were forcibly poured down his throat. And according to various researchers, this occurred upon the instructions of Mike Jeffrey but the deed was done by a couple of thugs from the Newcastle underworld who travelled down to London specially to do the job. So Leonard Cohen was in town a few days before this, according to Anne Diamond, and then a few days afterwards he disappeared. Ten years later, Leonard popped up in New York in December 1980, just a few days before John Lennon was assassinated outside the Dakota building, and then a couple of days after that, he's gone again and he holed himself up on a remote Greek island for several months. That's what Anne Diamond says of Leonard Cohen. One other thing that she says is that when she was in McGill University, having that experimentation done on her, she remembers a young Mick Jagger. In those days, he was known simply as Michael, she says. He was a young lad and she has memories of him receiving his programming right there in McGill. I'm going to play you an excerpt from that interview here because as well as talking about Leonard Cohen, she got into some of the other agendas that popular rock music has been used to push. And I think you'll find what she has to say here quite revealing. McGill was connected with Tavistock, okay? Yeah. And some of the psychiatrists who were programming patients, but I think particularly children at McGill, in the 1950s were the same psychiatrists that you know they would have known them either known or been the same people that were at Tavistock there was a there was an entertainment music connection and the and part of what was going on at McGill in this in the, in the center of Montreal which had been the jazz capital of Canada and North almost North, of North America well like New Orleans and New York you know um, was that they were programming uh, artists and musicians in particular because you know the the Air Force owned EMI, 
the recording studio in London where the Stones and the Beatles recorded. And they, they had developed a, a form of uh, mind control programming using electronic signals, right? And they were expanding that. And the top psychiatrist, Dr. Cameron at the Allen Memorial used to talk and write about how rock and roll music could be the vector of mental illness. He said, you could, you could create rock stars who are mentally ill and then they could spread mental illness to a whole population, which was really his you know, goal, was to make everyone schizophrenic and controllable through drugs and different forms of you know, electronics and so on. And she's right there about those early record labels all having their roots in aspects of the military. So that's the case with RCA Records, Elvis Presley's label, the Radio Corporation of America directly developed out of the U.S. Navy. Decca, Parlophone, EMI, record labels for the Rolling Stones, the Beatles, Cliff Richards, all had military applications before they became record labels. They were researching radio technology, uh, sonar and radar systems, different methods of distributing audio before they became record labels and started putting out all these early artists. So, a lifetime actor's work is never done. And when you're signed up with those that control these industries, you are in it for life. And when that message comes through, that there's an agenda that needs propping up, and your voice is needed to help achieve it, you don't say no. You can't say no. So here we are, a story from 2021. Sir Mick Jagger hits out at anti-vaxxers. You can't argue with these people, he says. Of course he does, because he's been told to say it. Here's another one. Sir Paul McCartney, or whoever it is. That's another talk. Sir Billy Shears encourages his fans to get vaccinated against coronavirus. Be cool. Get vaxxed, says Sir Paul slash Billy. Here's his bandmate, Sir Ringo. Not just any old Ringo, he was knighted himself, you know. 2014, he got his gong at the palace for a lifetime of services rendered. So here he is on New Year's Eve 2020. Do you remember 2020? It's a lovely year, wasn't it? We had so much fun. And on New Year's Eve, God. The parties, New Year's Eve 2020. Oh, yeah, party of a lifetime. Ringo put out this video in his mask, in his own home, by himself. And his message was, do everything the government tells you, take your vaccine, wear your mask, and we'll get back to normal as soon as we can. And then he puts his mask back on and keeps on drumming. So, you know, Ringo is one of those guys that drives around in a car by himself wearing a mask, stopping himself from giving himself the virus, you know? Because he's told to do so. Here's another sir. You know, it's interesting because Bono used to get the most groans in my talks, but he's been eclipsed by Sir Elton. It's amazing. So here's Sir Elton, and here's uh, a little word from him from a couple of years ago from an ad that he made for the NHS. Do we want to hear from Elton and his message? No. Uh, well, we're going to have to because it helps to make the point. My name is Elton John. Well, it's not, yeah, not the best of starts. Bit more showbiz. My name is Elton John. Let's go for your Michael Caine impression. Just let, let's see what it's like. My name is Elton John. Beautiful cut there. The more people in society that get vaccinated, the more chance there is of eradicating the national COVID pandemic. Yeah, that's right, that's right. So they get all the fluffy, fun stuff out of the way, the joking around, you know, to get you to like Elton. So you think, oh, he's, he's quite nice, really, isn't he? And then comes the message they really want to deliver. And he wasn't the only sir who appeared in that ad. He was in very good company because appearing <laughs> alongside him was oh, Sir Michael Caine. 
In the same way that you can't have a career like Mick Jagger or Elton John that lasts several decades and become that influential and that prominent in the music world, so it is in the acting world. You can't have the number of roles this guy has, you can't have appeared in the number of iconic films that he has without that career having been handed to you. And when it is, it comes with a price attached, which is when you're called upon to prop up some agenda or other, you have no option but to take part. Here he is doing just that. I've just had a vaccine for COVID. It didn't hurt. Not many people know that. There you go. And I suspect strongly that many of these individuals, even in spite of their wealth and their prominence and their perceived success, would change places with the likes of us in a heartbeat if they could. Because the terrible truth of their lives is that they cannot call their hearts, their minds, their souls, if they have any, their own. They can't make their own decisions. They can't even go down to the local grocery store for a pint of milk and a loaf of bread. These are things which we take for granted, but which these individuals can't do. And I'm sure once many of them discover the terrible truth of what it is they're involved in, they would go back to the kind of lives that we lead in a heartbeat if they could. But they can't, because there comes a point where it's too late. So fads, trends, movements, scenes, it doesn't matter whether it's the hippie flower power thing, it doesn't matter whether it's acid house and rave culture, it doesn't matter whether it's rock music, heavy metal, it doesn't matter whether it's punk or new wave, I don't care. If it's a scene and if it sweeps up millions of fans and it has people acting in certain ways, behaving, dressing in certain ways, then it's been put out there by master social engineers who have devised the whole thing. And so it was with the punk scene. It's no different. If there were any genuine punk rockers and anarchists out there, don't you think they might have had a thing or two to say about what we've all been living through these past three and a half years? Well, he has and he hasn't. He did, he did one film. I mean, when the political activists of a generation are right said Fred, something has gone desperately wrong in the world, right? It shouldn't be left to right said Fred. It really shouldn't. You know, we should have expected, we should have expected to have heard a word or two from Johnny Rotten, shouldn't we? Paul Weller, what's he had to say? Billy Bragg. The only thing Billy Bragg's had to say is wear your mask, guys. It's disgusting. It's disgraceful. It's pathetic. There are no anarchists. There are no rebels. These are fake manufactured images. The real acid test of these people and where their loyalties lie has been in the last three and a half years, hasn't it? It doesn't get any more extreme than that. But where have they been? Nowhere to be heard. Fake rebels, fake anarchists, complete fake manufactured heroes. So the punk scene, which had the Sex Pistols as its poster children on this side of the pond, that was a group put together by Malcolm McLaren in the same way that a boy band is pieced together. You know, the odd musician from here and there and they're all patched together and put out there just like Boy's Own or One Direction would be. We're pushing agendas. I mean, Sid Vicious, real name John Simon Ritchie, his parents met when they both served in the Royal Air Force. Yeah, punk rock. <laughs> also, Sid Vicious's father worked for a time as a guardsman, a beef eater, at Buckingham Palace. John Lydon, Johnny Rotten, wrote in his autobiography that just prior to finding fame with the Sex Pistols, he used to attend kinky sex parties at the House of Commons, where he saw various prominent MPs in compromising positions with call girls and rent boys. Yes. But he doesn't explain what he himself was doing there in the first place. But either way, the Sex Pistols were a construct in just the same way as so many of these other bands were a construct. We have a great story when it comes to the punk and new wave scene coming from this particular family the Copelands. Here we have direct connections 
going back into the world of military intelligence. So there was this career CIA officer by the name of Miles Axe Copeland. He worked for the agency for many decades. He had postings all over the world. He was involved in various political coups. And he had three sons, all born in Beirut, which is a major CIA stronghold. And they were all put to use in the music industry. So there was Ian Copeland. In the middle, you might recognize Stuart Copeland, the drummer with the group The Police. And then on the right, we've got Miles, uh, Miles Copeland Jr. So these three, between them, ran record labels, uh, booking agencies that dealt with the punk and new wave bands of the time. They had a show on MTV in which they would only promote acts signed to their own label, their own agency. They had a holding company for all their operations, which was known as Copeland International Artists, or CIA. It's not like they don't offer you the odd clue from time to time if you're paying attention. So as well as Copeland International Artists, they also operated Frontier Booking International. They also had uh, International Records Syndicate. And their house band through which they operated was the police. As in, they were there to police the other groups in that punk and new wave scene. And basically, you did not get success as a band in those genres without the blessing of the Copeland family. So that's the police with sting, as in a sting operation. So a sting operation is one that you never see coming and it takes you by surprise. And over on the right, we have the aforementioned sting striking quite an interesting pose with his arm inside his jacket. So this is a sign which comes straight out of Freemasonry. It denotes the hidden hand of the Brotherhood and it's a method of communication for those with the eyes to see to indicate where their allegiances lie. Now it's starting to become a bit more apparent as to just why the police and Sting were so influential and successful. Could it also explain why the Beatles, above and beyond all other contenders, became arguably the most famous and influential pop group of all time. Here we have Lennon and McCartney, I think that's McCartney 1.0 actually, uh, with exactly the same hand sign indicating that perhaps this might hold the key to why the Beatles were as influential as they were. Dave Grohl, yeah, out of the Foo Fighters, previously involved with Nirvana in the Kurt Cobain era. Didn't end too well, well not for Kurt anyway. So Dave went on to form the Foo Fighters. Dave seems to be pretty obsessed with the number 666. So Foo equates in gematria to 666, F being the sixth letter of the alphabet, and O being the 15th, one plus five is six. So he named his group that way. Here we've got a credit card bill from a meal where Dave Grohl went out to eat, and the bill came to $333. Must have been a hell of a meal. And Dave, generous guy as he is, decided to round up the tip to $666. Of course he did. So he seems to have an obsession with the number 666. This is a number which is beloved of the occultists who preside over the music industry. So it is a fact that those who run the record industry, as well as the Hollywood film industry, television, and actually every other expression and every other walk of life within organized society. So the world of medicine, the world of science, the world of academia, the world of politics, the world of big business, whatever else it may be, all belong to a dark occult priest class operating through different secret society networks. It's a hierarchical structure and the instructions come from on high and get filtered down through the system, through the networks to where they get implemented. It gets done through popular culture and entertainment just as much as it gets done through the world of politics and everything else. But what links all these different expressions of society is the fact that sitting atop all of them are occultists, Satanists, Luciferians, 
call them what you will, they come in different shapes and sizes, but they know how to harness unseen forces. Uh, they know how to uh, manipulate energy effectively and to make it work to help them achieve their aims. This is key to understanding so much of what these industries are really used for. If you don't accept that there are hidden, spiritual, metaphysical, occult aspects to what's going on, you're missing a huge part of the picture and you're never going to get a real proper grasp on it. So 666 is a number which occultists love, dark occultists. It's not an inherently evil number in itself. No numbers or symbols are. It's all down to the uh, will and the intent and the consciousness which is applied to it. So 666 can be adopted by dark occultists to further their aims. And when it comes to the music business, it most certainly has been. So there was this movie, Studio 666, starring Dave Grohl and his bandmates from the Foo Fighters, which came out last year. In it, the group hold themselves up in this haunted mansion to try and record an album, and various disasters befall the different band members, including Taylor Hawkins, the drummer, who is depicted being ritually decapitated by a symbol. Shortly after this film was released, Taylor Hawkins turned up dead in extremely suspicious circumstances for real. The whole thing smacked of a ritual sacrifice, which unfortunately is another very unsavory, ugly aspect to the entertainment business. I've done whole different presentations on this. I detail it all in my books. Many other researchers get into this as well. Some great videos on YouTube about it. Don't really have time to go into great detail this evening, but suffice to say that it's an unfortunate aspect of what goes on in these industries. So the interesting thing about um, Dave Grohl is that his father, James Harper Grohl, worked as an assistant to the son of William Howard Taft, who was the 27th president of the United States. His father was Alfonso Taft, who was the founding member of the Skull and Bones Secret Society Mystery School Fraternity, operating out of Yale University. So we've got more direct connections between a prominent, influential rock star and expressions of secret society networks and also expressions of the government. They just keep on coming. In fact, it becomes difficult to find a rock star who doesn't have that kind of background. Here's another one, Michael Stipe out of REM. They've put out many revealing songs like Orange Crush, for example, talking about the use of Agent Orange in Vietnam. And he is a guy who would know a thing or two about how it gets done given that his father flew helicopters in Vietnam, another career military guy. So at the start of Convid 1.0 in 2020, don't worry, the sequel's coming soon, <laughs> he put out a message in March saying, it's the end of the world as we know it and I feel fine. And then he says, don't worry, we'll celebrate in four months. So four months on from March was July 2020, which was when certain factions of American society first started opening up after the initial wave of lockdowns. Hmm. It's almost as if Michael had an inside heads up as to what the agenda and the timescale was going to be, but I'm sure that can't possibly be the case. Um. Plenty more to come in part two. We're going to take a brief break here of around about 15 minutes, so... Feel free to grab some refreshments, stretch your legs. Do come back for part two, though. Lots of great stuff. And I'll leave you at the end of part one with some wise words from George Carlin, which pretty much sums up the whole thing. I'm sure you know it by now. It's a big club and you ain't in it, nor would you want to be. See you in part two. That was excellent, Mark. Please get yourselves a drink, go to the toilet. You've got 15 minutes, part two will be on. <laughs>